Good evening. Good evening. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. You ready to get loved on by the Lord? Yeah. All right. Well, I think we have more kids than adults, huh? We're supposed to have faith like children. Did you hear that? And this sign was louder than that sign. Oh, wow. <laughs> Will you stand with me? We'll go to the Lord. Father, we just thank you for this beautiful day and uh, another another opportunity to just come and spend our time with you, Lord. Uh, and we just came expecting you to touch our hearts. Uh, Father, we just ask that you bless this time, uh, bless the, the Bible studies that are going on in this building, Lord, and just, just feel the love that we have for you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's worship God together. Amen. I'm pressing on the upward way. New hearts I made.
praise God. Praise you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord.
to make bread to eat. Has anybody pulled out a loaf of Ezekiel bread out of the freezer section of the grocery stores? No. It's packed with nutrients, different grains that are beneficial. You don't see grain that's set aside for cattle in the grocery store because there's not much nutritional value to it. But try to get a loaf of Ezekiel bread. You'd be amazed at it. Well, God's not telling Ezekiel to make Ezekiel bread. <laughs> He's telling him to make bread out of grains that aren't good, very good to eat and of vegetables. In all countries in the East, it was, uh, it was a necessity to combine different grains together to make the supplies last longer. So if you have some good grain, start mixing in the poor stuff, the stuff that you wouldn't want to eat very often. Here, Ezekiel is commanded to make a total of 390 loaves out of this mixture of grain, making one loaf for each day of the seas. This mixture of three grains and two vegetables produced very poor quality bread. This represented <coughs> the scarcity of food during the seas and the people would resort <coughs> to eat anything. After Ezekiel prepared the meal for the bread he was to make, he was now to prepare the meat he was to eat. He was, he was to pair meat weighing into a portion of 20 shekels each. A shekel is approximately a half ounce. Thus, a 20 shekel portion of meat is 10 ounces. Now he was, was to set aside enough water to have one and a half pint per day of the seeds. This is a pint of water. You have one and a half of these each day during the day, the 390 days of the seeds. Not much water. 10 ounces of meat. About this size. Look, meat a little bit smaller because it's more dense than bread. But it's about this size. And this is about the size of loaf of bread he has to make. Not very much. And can you see he's setting aside 395, 390 of these. And 390 portions of meat. What do you think will happen after a couple days? It's not steak. It stinks. You got green fuzzy stuff growing on it. It's like when you stick meat in your refrigerator thinking you're going to fix it and somebody goes, let's go out to eat. Well, you go out to eat and you come back you forget that you had it in the refrigerator at the end of the week. Well, I need to clean out my refrigerator. You pull out this bag of green goo. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what Ezekiel was eating for 390 days. Not very appetizing. And let alone eating dry bread with just a little bit of water. That was for Ezekiel. He must have had a he must have lost a lot of weight during his ministry <laughs> for the 390 days he laid on his side. That's called the Ezekiel diet. <laughs> <laughs> After Ezekiel gathered his provisions, he was not instructed on how to cook the bread. He was instructed to use fire made out of his own dung to bake the bread. That's pretty disgusting. Yeah. Throughout the region, it was common to use animal dung as a fuel source. They didn't cook the bread directly on the animal dung. They had the dung in the fire burning. Then they laid a large flat rock or a large plate on top of the fire and stuck the loaf of bread that it's going to cook on top. It's almost like a dry frying bread instead of baking it. Just dry fry it to get it where it's not as raw tasting. But to use human dung was disgusting and was a sign of extreme wretchedness that the Jews were going to be exposed to during the siege. The occupants of the city could not go out and come as they please. Ezekiel pleaded with God not to have used his own dung for fuel. God relented and allowed Ezekiel to use cow dung instead. 
During the siege, the Jews would experience extreme hardship. They would have very little to eat, very little to drink, and they would have a disgusting source of fuel in which to bake their bread. In either case, the bread did not come into contact with the whatever he used as fuel. Deuteronomy chapter 28 spells out how low in depravity the residents of a city under siege would sink. Deuteronomy 28, 49 to 57. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young, and he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle, and the fruit of thy land, until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee either corn, wine, or oil, or the increase of thy kind, or flocks of thy sheep, until he have destroyed them. So the invading arms come in, they're, they're basically practicing scorched earth mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. doctrine. They scorch everything in the past. That you get the you know the old saying to the victor belong the spoils. Mm -hmm. They spoiled everything. Mm -hmm. The victors didn't have anything either. They destroyed it all. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates until thy high and fenced walls come down, wherein thou trustest throughout all thy land, and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout all thy land, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. And thou shalt eat of the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons and thy daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee, in the seas and in the straightness wherein thy enemies shall distress thee, so that the man that is tender among you and very delicate, his eyes shall be evil towards his brother and toward the wife of his bosom and toward the remnant of his children which he shall leave, so that he will not give to any of them of the flesh of his children whom she he shall eat. Talk about cannibalism here. That's what they're going to have to resort to. Because he hath nothing left in him to siege, and in the straightness wherein thy enemy shall distress thee in all thy gates. The tender and delicate women among you, which are not adventure to set soul of her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness, her eyes shall be evil toward the husband of her bosom, and toward her son, and toward her daughter, and toward her young one that cometh out from heaven, well, that cometh out from between her feet toward her children which she shall bear, and she shall eat them for want of all things secretly in the seas and straightness, wherewith thy enemies shall distress thee in thy gates, that thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God. Then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful, and the plagues of thy seed, even plagues among a long con continuance of sore sickness and a long continuance. It's pretty disgusting. People are turning against people. Anybody seen the movie Galaxy Quest with Tim Allen's Gordon Weaver? They had to go out and get a beryllium sphere, the power of the spaceship. <coughs> beryllium spheres don't exist anywhere. It's just one of those things that they. It's a spoof on Star Trek is what it is. Mm -hmm. And there are these miners. They come out, come out around, around the beryllium sphere. And they look so cute and so innocent. Then Guy, one of the crew members of the Gal of Galaxy Quest, he goes, look, they're so cute. And he goes, no, nah, it's going to turn evil. It's going to get ugly. And no sooner he said that, one little minor, alien dude, bald headed, cute, you know, big ears, cute, kind of looks like Dopey in the Seven Dwarfs. <laughs> he comes limping over to the water trough to get some water. He was thirsty. And he started drinking water. All of a sudden, these other miners, their eyes get really big, their mouth goes from ear to ear, nothing but sharp teeth, and they pounce on him. That's a picture of what's happening here. Parents are pouncing on each other, they're pouncing on their kids, they're pouncing on their neighbors. They want to eat, they're desperate. It's 
like the movie uh, Book of Eli. Have you seen that one? Those people were desperate. They resorted to cannibalism. And cannibalism, eating human meat, I guess you call it meat, I don't know, is disgusting, is not good for you. It causes all kinds of problems, physiological and mental problems. But this is what they're going through in the siege. God had given the children of Israel a land of milk and honey. A land of promise, a land of blessing, if they would only follow him. Instead, the children of Israel chose to do it their own way by following after false gods, so God cursed their blessings. Malachi 2.2 If ye will not hear, and if ye will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already, because you do not lay it to heart. If you don't want God to curse your blessings, pay attention to them. As a Christian, we have a covenant with Jesus Christ. They had a covenant with God. If the people call me by name, I will bless them and heal their lands. Over and over in the book of Judges, it's either seven or nine times that people started out doing good for one generation, the second generation did good. By the time we got to the third generation, they fell away from serving God. That's parents, children, grandchildren starting to fall away. Did God send a nation coming in? To beseech them, to attack them, and call upon them to wake up, saying, I am the Lord thy God. People cried out. They wanted deliverance. So God sent a person in that was able to deliver them from the situation. Again, that generation that was delivered, they walked the walk, they talked the talk. The second generation, their kids did the same thing. They came down to the grandkids. It's important, based on this example, that we pray for our grandkids. We pray for our kids to teach our grandkids God's way. It would be beneficial for them and be beneficial for the grandkids as well. The land of Milk and honey, the holy city of Jerusalem, became a place of scarcity and hunger, where parents ate their own children to stay alive during the siege. And this concludes the third illustrated sermon of Ezekiel. Now we move on to Ezekiel's fourth illustrated sermon. We find that in Ezekiel 5, verses 1 to 17. And thou, son of man, take thee a sharp knife, take thee a barber's razor, and cause it to pass upon thy head and upon thy beard. Then take the balances to weigh and divide the hair. Thou shalt burn with the fire a third part in the midst of the city, when the days of seeds are fulfilled. And thou shalt take a third part and smite it with a knife. And a third part thou shalt scatter in the wind. And I will draw out a sword after them. Thou shalt also take thereof a few in number and bind them in thy skirt. Then take of them again, and cast them into the midst of the fire, and burn them in the fire, for thereof shall a fire come forth into all the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord God, This is Jerusalem. I have set it in the midst of nations and countries that are round about her, and she hath changed my judgments into wickedness more than the nations, and my statutes more than the countries that are round about her. For they have fused my judgments and my statutes, they have not walked in them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because ye multiplied more than the nations that are round about you, and have not walked in my statutes, neither have kept my judgments, neither have done according to the judgments of the nations that are round about you. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, am against thee, and will execute judgments in the midst of thee in the sight of the nations. Uh, do in thee that which I have not done, Whereunto I will not do any more like because of thine abominations. 
Therefore the fathers shall eat the sons in the midst of thee, and the sons shall eat their fathers, and now I execute judgment in thee, and the whole remnant of thee I will scatter to all the winds. Wherefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, surely, because thou hast defiled my sanctuary with all thy detestable things and with all thy abominations, therefore I will also diminish thee, neither shall my eye spare, neither will I have any pity. A third part of thee shall die in the pit with the pestilence and the famine shall they be consumed in the midst of thee and the third part shall fall by the sword round about thee and I will scatter a third part into all the winds and I will draw out a sword after them thus shall my anger be accomplished and I will cause my fury to rest upon them and I will be comforted and they shall know that I am the Lord has spoken in my seal when I have accomplished my fury in them moreover I will make thee waste and a reproach among the nation that are round about thee in the sight of all that pass by. So it shall be a reproach and a taunt and instruction and an astonishment, an astonishment into the nations that are round about thee. And I shall execute judgments in thee in anger and in fury and in furious rebukes. I, the Lord, have spoken. When I shall send upon them the evil arrows of famine, it shall be for their destruction which I send to destroy you, and I will increase the famine upon you, and will break your staff of bread. So will I send upon you famine and evil beasts, that they shall bereave thee, and pestilence and blood shall pass through thee, and I bring the sword upon thee. I, the Lord, have spoken it. You don't want God to pronounce judgment on you at the end here and says, I, the Lord, have spoken it. It's come to pass whether you want it to or not. Why do people not want to obey God? Why don't they want to keep his covenant? Are they all Frank Sinatra's? I did it my way? <laughs> our flesh wants what our flesh wants. Our flesh is weak. We are weak. But who makes us strong? Jesus. Jesus does. The prophet Isaiah compared the invasion of enemy forces to that of shaving a man's head. Likewise, Ezekiel uses the same example in his fourth illustrated sermon. The shaving of the head was part of a purification ritual, but the Jews had to be, be careful in how they went about this, especially a priest. When Ezekiel shaved his head, it must have caused uproar in the camp and stunned the people by his actions not normal for a priest to shave his head. Ezekiel resorted to extreme measures to get an important message across. Would we be stunned if Pastor got pulled out a sword and shaved his head? <laughs> and his beard? Yes, he's stunned. Oh, I don't think it'd be cool. We'd be shocked. What's going on? What's coming down? <laughs> They were shocked by the action of the priest. The shaving of the head and beard was a sign of great humiliation and sorrow. But that is how God felt about the impending invasion and the impending destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Ezekiel did not use a razor to shave his head and beard. He used a sword. The use of a sword signified the coming enemy that was going to cut down the people and the land. Beginning with Chapter 6 of Ezekiel through chapter 7, we find two spoken messages that Ezekiel made to the captives. These spoken messages concern the judgment of the land and the devastation of the land. Chapter 6 explains the idolatry that people committed that had defiled the land and temple. And chapter 7 describes the terrible destruction that would come by the invading Babylonians. Ezekiel was a faithful watchman on the wall warning the nation that the nation was coming because God has seen their wicked ways. And we're going to talk about the judgment of the land. It's in Ezekiel 6, 1-14. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set thy face toward the mountain of Israel, and prophesy against them. And say, ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God to the mountains, and to the hills, to the rivers, and to the valleys, Behold, I, even I, will bring a sword upon you and will destroy your high places. 
and your altars shall be desolate, and your images shall be broken, and I will cast down your slain men before your idols, and I will lay the dead carcasses of the children of Israel before their idols, and I will scatter your bones around about your altars. In all your dwelling places the city shall be laid waste, and the high places shall be desolate, that your altars may be laid waste and be made desolate, and your idols may be broken and cease, and your images may be cut down, and your works may be abolished. And the slain shall fall in the midst of you, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Yet I will leave a remnant, that ye may have some that shall escape the sword among the nations, and ye shall be scattered throughout the countries. They that escape of you shall remember me among the nations, whether they shall be carried captive, because I am broken with their whorish heart, and they have departed from me, and their eyes which go a whoring after their idols, and they shall loathe themselves for the evils which they have committed in all their abominations. And they shall know that I am the Lord, and that I have not said in vain that I would do this evil unto them. Thus saith the Lord God, smite thy hands and stamp thy foot, and say, Alas for all the evil abominations of the house of Israel, for they shall fall by the sword, by the famine, and by pestilence. He that is far off shall die of the pestilence, and he that is near shall fall by the sword. And he that remaineth and is besieged shall die by the famine. Thus I'll accomplish my fury upon them, that ye shall know that I am the Lord, when they slain men shall be among their idols round about their altars, upon every high hill, in all the tops of the mountains, and under every green tree, and under every thick oak, the place where they did offer a sweet savor to all their idols. So I'll stretch out my hand upon them, and make the land desolate. Yea, more desolate than the wilderness toward Dibloth, and all their habitation, and they shall know that I am the Lord. The whole land that they were occupying will become desolate. Mm -hmm. The last desolation we've seen of the land of Israel happened sometime after 70 AD when Titus destroyed Jerusalem. The Romans salted the land, mm -hmm. killed everything. It was a land flowing with milk and honey, now it's just a barren desert. The salt killed everything and nothing grew. Until 1948, God called his people back to their homeland they started planting, they started prospering, and things started growing again. Israel today is the number three exporter in the world of fresh fruit and produce. The land belongs to the Lord, always has, and will always belong to the Lord. We know this by reading Leviticus 25, 23. The land shall not be sold forever, the land is mine, for ye are strangers and sojourners with me. God has allowed his chosen people to occupy the land as long as they continue to observe the covenant he had with them. They were to have a mindset as tenants, with a permanent dwelling being with God in heaven. They were to be stewards of the land. You know, I know what a steward is? He's a caretaker, he's a manager of someone else's possessions. We are called to be stewards of God's possessions. God give us things and we're to be good stewards of it. If we're not good stewards, what happens? Yeah, everything goes like Randy, Randy said, but God will, will not give us any more blessings until we can show him that we can take care of what he has given us. A steward was not the owner of the land, but was responsible for the care of the land for the owner. In this case, the owner of the land was God. If they chose to disregard the covenant, God would withhold his blessing concerning the land. Like Jonah being upchucked from the well, Israel would also be upchucked out of the land. It would not be a pretty picture. It would be disgusting. God warned the nation previously in Leviticus what would happen if they defiled the land. Leviticus 18, 24-30. Defile not yourselves in any of these things, for in, for in all these nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. And the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. He shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, neither any 
of your own nation, nor any stranger that sojourneth with you. For all these abominations have the men of the land done, which were before you, and the land is defiled. That the land spew you not out also, when you defile it, as it spewed out the nations that were before you. For whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the souls of them that commit them shall be cut off from among the people. Therefore shall ye keep mine ordinance, that ye commit not any of these abominable customs which were committed before you, that ye defile not yourselves therein. I am the Lord your God. God did not defile the land. It's the people, because of their disobedience, defiled the land. These verses explain why Ezekiel was told to set his face against the mountains, the hills, rivers, and valleys. Because the land had been defiled. It must be understood, it must be known that the land did not sin. The land is the inanimate object. It was the people that occupying the land that sinned. All prophets, including Ezekiel, spoke out against defiling the land and spoke out against idol worship. The prophets spoke of idols as nothing but an abomination and as obscene terrors. One commenter stated that the word idol that Ezekiel used could mean pieces of dung. Well, you can take that further in your own mind. But this is how we should view idols. Something that is revolting, disgusting, and abhorrent. Do we have idols in our lives that, need to re that we need to remove in order to stay within God's blessings? I want to say we all do at one time or another. One I had in the past was my new truck. I loved that truck. <laughs> but it ended up sitting in our backyard for over a year and a half because it didn't run. Until I got in my mind, it's just a truck. That's all it was. By the disobedience. They worshiped false idols on the land. In the hills around them, they took to the high places and the groves of trees, set their altars, and had their, <coughs> I don't say, powwows, whatever, to the false gods. And they didn't rest, let the land rest every seven years. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And that too. Every seven years, every seventh year is supposed to be a Sabbath. Every 50 years, a year of Jubilee, they missed all of that. That was one of God's big covenants, covenant uh, items with Israel. But they didn't do that. What happens to an individual that works 24-7, 365 days a year? Burn out. They burn out. Burn out. They burn out, right? God gave us the Sabbath day to rest. He set it as an example back in Genesis. On the seventh day, God rested. When the Babylonians come, they will destroy the sinners of idol worship because the Babylonians had their own idols. And the bodies of the idol worshipers were stacked like cords of firewood around the destroyed altars. You kind of, kind of take a picture that, look at that, I'm sure some of you, if, you, if they didn't uh, squeegee clean the history textbooks, yeah. the te some older textbooks have images of the concentration camps where the Jews were exterminated. Yeah. So army soldiers coming in and the bodies were stacked like firewood cords. This is what this is showing. That they stack these false worshipers like firewood around their destroyed altars. Uh, Michael was as you are aware, they've cleansed our textbooks now. No longer use, some places don't even teach that at all. Don and I, when we were in Israel, and some of the others who were there, we went to the uh, the Holocaust Museum. And I'm going to tell you the truth, I could not handle it. Mm -hmm. I walked through and it was, it was devastating. They had the real pictures and movies, the real movies that they had recorded of them, not not document, not documentaries, but real movies. And I tell you the truth, I, I told Don, I said, 
I've got to go. You had to go out one end. I just took off. And I think she found me a little. You did find me later, didn't you? Yeah, we, yeah, we came home. Together. <laughs> Anyways, it, it's horrible. It was horrible. Throughout the history of Israel, godly kings would destroy these shrines, and then the ungodly kings would rebuild these shrines. You will find examples of this throughout the Second Kings. Destruction was on its way. In the background of this impending doom, God still has a plan. He is still in control. God will save a remnant of his chosen people. The faithful do not bow to worship idols. We read through the verse where he's take the takes the straw and cuts it one third, one third, and one yeah. third. First third represent yeah. the siege, the second third the famine, and the third is a remnant that was left. He's supposed to cut the little pieces and sold into his garment. God will always save a remnant of his people. You see it throughout the history of Israel. Mm -hmm. God saved the remnant of his people in 70 AD. They were dispersed in all the countries of the world. And they're still coming back into Israel. Because God still has a plan for them. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Ezekiel 6, 8 to 10. In all your dwelling places, the cities shall be laid west, waste, and the high places shall be desolate, that your altars may be laid waste and made desolate, and your idols may be broken and cease, and your images may be cut down. And your works may be abolished, and the slain shall fall in the midst of you, and, I sh and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Yet I will leave a remnant, that ye may have some that shall escape the sword among the nations, and ye shall be scattered throughout the countries, and, that, and they that escape of you shall remember me among the nations, where they be carried captives, because I am broken with the whorish heart which hath departed from me. Not only was idol worship an abomination, it was adultery as well. The nation of Israel had been married to God in Sinai, and the act of adultery was a sign of unfaithfulness among his people. Our God is a jealous God. He is jealous over his people. His adulterous wife, Israel, and his jealousy is mentioned several times in the Bible. Is mentioned in the book of Ezekiel in chapters 8, 16, 42, 25, 36, and 38. I'll read a, I'll read a couple of them here. And I will judge thee as a woman that breaketh wedlock and, shall, and shed blood are judged, and I give thee blood in fury and jealousy. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there should be a great shaking in the land of Israel. The love that God has for Israel is explained in the book of Hosea. Here in this book of Hosea, used an illustrated sermon by marrying a prostitute and bringing her home every time she strayed. Hosea assured the nation of Israel that God, that if they repented and returned to God, God will forgive them of their sin. God will forgive them of their sin if they repented. That's the operative word, is to repent. God saved the remnant of Israel by keeping some in Babylon and a few that were scattered abroad. It is out of this remnant that the nation of Israel be, would be rebuilt. This remnant included Daniel and Nehemiah. In the midst of this judgment, God will remember his mercy. You see that in Habakkuk 3 2. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known in wrath remember mercy we all need god's mercy goodness is the nature of god and mercy flows from that goodness we sing a song his goodness and mercy runneth after me all you gotta do is stop you know i'll catch up to you you don't have to keep running from god's goodness and mercy 
every morning, Lynn and I thank God for his grace and his mercy upon us, upon our kids and grandkids. And we continue to ask that blessing each day for us, our kids and grandkids. Amen. We don't want to forget that God has blessed us and he has mercy upon us. Because we are fallen creatures. We have unhealthy desires from time to time. But we need to repent of those and God will show us grace and mercy. Amen. Psalms 25, 6 and 7. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindness, for they have been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions, according to thy mercy. Remember thou me for thy goodness' sake. As we continue in reading chapter 6, we come across the weapons of destruction that God used. And it's, I guess, 8 o'clock, so I'll end it there. But, uh, there's some more things I have in here that, that's pretty disgusting or horrific. Talks about siege and pestilence and the effect it has on a population. So we'll pick up next week, Ezekiel 6, 11 to 14. Thank you, Michael. I, as I listen to this, I say, thank God we live in a, an age of grace. Amen. Amen. And, uh, not to say that he's not going, that God's not going to, you know, bring things to just uh, before it's all said and done. I think it was, uh, what was it, Billy Graham's wife that said, that if America doesn't repent, then God would have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah, <laughs> you know, because we're about as bad. But uh, thank God for his grace and his mercy, as Michael concluded with it. So, Amen. Um, be back next week. We'll pick it right up right where we left off unless Jesus comes. If he does. Yep. See you there. See you there. See you there. <laughs> See you there. <laughs> Father, keep your hand on the sky as we lead tonight. Keep us safe as we travel, we pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless.